Uh, my name is Ben Bussey. I'm the head of product with uh, Dream Factory. And I'm joined today by Todd Appleton, our director of engineering. And we're going to be talking today for about an hour. Um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And we're going to be covering uh, Dream Factory 2.0, which we're uh, just released into production. And we're really excited uh, about uh, the release and want to tell everyone about it today. So with that, let's get started. Um, so quick agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an overview of Dream Factory 2.0. Um, that'll be a, just a few minutes. We'll cover about 10 minutes of that. Most of the time today will be in the product demo, which Todd, Todd will be presenting. He's really excited about that. And then, as I mentioned, we'll leave uh, at least 10 or 15 minutes at the end for uh, questions and answers. So before we begin, um, some of you may be really familiar with the first generation of the product. Uh, some on the line here may know nothing really about Dream Factory or not even tried it out. So uh, before I talk about the new features in 2.0, I do want to uh, give a little bit of context about the product and its history and tell, tell you a little bit about it and what it is. So at a high level, Dream Factory is an open source REST API backend. Uh, it is a piece of software. Um, in this graphic here, it's, it's the functionality in uh, orange in the diagram. So it's a runtime platform. Uh, it's a LAMP stack. You can run it on any server. You can run it in the cloud. You can run it on your laptop. You can run it in your data center. You install it. And what it does at a high level is it connects to all sorts of different uh, data sources, such as SQL databases, uh, NoSQL databases, file storage, and you can even connect things like remote web services um, to it. And it auto-generates uh, REST APIs for all of these data sources automatically. So at its heart, um, that is the key capability. Um, on top of those APIs, it provides a whole scripting and customization capability, which lets you customize the behavior of your APIs. You can write custom scripts. You can customize the behavior of any of the API endpoints that are automatically generated. And then on top of that is really robust security control. So it comes with full-blown role-based access control, uh, authentication, single sign-on. Uh, a bunch of that we're going to cover today, including new features in 2.0 related to Active Directory and things like this. So what you can think about that, all these APIs and the back end built for you, what that means is you can just start developing software. So you can use, uh, you know, you can build mobile applications using all the popular uh, toolkits there on the front end. Um, you can build desktop, Internet of Things, it doesn't matter. Dream Factory works well with all of the uh, client um, toolkits. If you can call a REST API, then you can use Dream Factory. And what this means is your time to build an application is dramatically reduced. Um, you don't have to build APIs anymore. You don't have to uh, implement tons of, of server-side security controls, test all of that. And remember, each time you build a new application, you have to do this over and over. So Dream Factory, at its heart, is a complete platform for building many applications that are connecting to any data source uh, that your app needs to get to. Um, so the product has been in the market for quite a while. Uh, we have a few hundred thousand developers using it. Um, the first generation of the product came out in fall of 2013, and hopefully many folks on the line have used it and have been happy with it. Uh, but Dream Factory 2.0 has a number of significant enhancements that came from our own learning um, over the time that, that uh, we built the product, you know, um, about two years ago. And a lot of that has come from feedback from, from folks on here, from developers, um, people that are using the product and, and using it to develop uh, their apps and using it in production. So what I want to cover quickly are the big improvement areas in Dream Factory 2.0. Um, the first uh, I'll talk about briefly is really kind of under the hood. The, the system architecture we revamped a lot um, really to build a world-class engine for scalability and performance to really handle enterprise workloads um, really effectively. Uh, the second area is really um, some uh, functional and, and flexibility improvements in the security model and also really robust support for enterprise security. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the details of, of what that means. Uh, and really modernizing, actually, the technologies that we've used for security as well. And, and Todd will get into some of those details. And then the last area, I refer to this as API customization. So it's really providing additional capabilities for really um, implementing, you know, in some cases, very complex server-side uh, behavior. You, you hope you want to make your application simple, but not every application is as simple as, you know, create, read, update, and delete. Many times, of course, you have to do more complex uh, things with, with server-side logic, and we wanted to really make that easy uh, and improve that as well. So um, 
the system architecture, what does that mean? So there, there were two major things. When, when we went out with a product, um, we decided to use PHP, um, really popular um, language, great support, great frameworks, um, and it, that worked really well. Um, what we wanted to improve, though, uh, was performance, and we wanted to do that at really high transaction volumes. And so we made a decision in 2.0 to really look at the frameworks and the technologies around PHP, and we moved from the E framework to Laravel. Um, Laravel is a really popular framework. If you're not familiar with it, it's growing like crazy, uh, and it has a whole bunch of great capabilities, um, such as routing. It's open source. A lot of a lot of it we could use and leverage without having to rewrite. Um, you know, some of that core code ourselves. So we decided this is a great framework and we went down that path. The other thing uh, related to scalability and, and also around usability of security was modernizing the session handling. So we went from PHP session handling to uh, JSON Web Tokens or JWT for short. Uh, JWT is a, a, a great way to do stateless session handling and it lets you really scale up your, uh, your API calls um, to, to very, very, you know, high volume. Um, we stuck with V8JS. This is Google sources, uh, Google's open source rather um, scripting engine for JavaScript. Uh, this is you know, great for parallel processing. We'll talk a little bit more about other scripting like Node.js, but V8 at its heart is a sandbox scripting engine, and you can parallel process API calls. So really, the goal there with, with the system architecture was, um, you know, make it easy to scale out horizontally and/or vertically to any load that you need to get. Uh, to with a really fast API response. The second thing was flexibility around the installation. So we wanted to make it more package-based. Um, Todd will talk a little bit about what that means and show some examples. Um, we wanted it to, to be really easy to install what you need. So if you need user management, make that a module, install it. Make it easy to install it on infrastructure as a service, such as Amazon, platform as a service, um, such as Bluemix, uh, and other ones out there, um, OpenShift from Red Hat and so forth and also to supply a really good Docker package. So the, the way that it's packaged in 2.0 is better than it was packaged in, one, in 1 1.x, the first generation, uh, because it's much more modular. Uh, the other thing, we have a, a bunch of companion technologies, all open source, so we, we wanted the ability to switch to Nginx for your web server from Apache. You can go back and forth. It defaults to Apache, but it's very trivial to move to Nginx, which has great uh, performance characteristics. And then also MongoDB, the world's most popular NoSQL database, um, we wanted that to be pre-installed and ready to go with a REST API uh, and make that just the usability of that a lot better. So you can just install it um, from our partner Bitnami, install Dream Factory, and bam, MongoDB is ready to go, ready to use it. And then lastly, we wanted the ability to for customers to just choose their native SQL database. So Dream Factory as a LAMP stack actually comes with a SQL database ready to use, both for the database calls, like an API for data, as well as for your user management. So we wanted to make it easy for you to pretty much choose any SQL database that you want for the native database that's pre-installed. Uh, if you don't want MySQL, then you can use a different database if you'd like. So security is a huge area, um, very important, obviously, um, often very hard to implement, and often um, not as secure as you would want. So what we did is we really went to the drawing board on security. Um, First generation of the product had great security, still does, but 2.0 represents a, a major improvement um, in a number of things. I would say uh, the key thing is integration. So um, LDAP, really popular, and for enterprises, Active Directory. Uh, so we implemented some basic integration to, to AD or Active Directory. So you can use your AD to do single sign-on and associate uh, uh, roles in Dream Factory of the particular uh, user, an end user. So this lets you, uh, you know, have users authenticate with a username and password through AD and tunnel that into Dream Factory, which provides the access rights on the API. OAuth integration was uh, not so good in the first generation, not implemented um, in a way that was very usable. So we added all of the popular uh, OAuth sources, which makes it really easy to like register users. Uh, via Facebook or, or authenticate them rather via Facebook, Twitter, Google, GitHub. Um, and then again, similar to AD, you can tie those OAuth uh, credentials um, to a specific uh, or OAuth provider to a specific role in Dream Factory. And you can have as many of these OAuth providers as you want. Remember, you might be building many applications and the role access control can be different for each of those applications. That brings me to the next point, which is flexible role-based security. First generation uh, 1.x. Uh, was limited in this regard. E basically, each end user had 
a uh, single role. So each end user has an email and password, and that was associated with a single role, which governs access to the apps and to the API. And so we wanted to make this a lot more flexible based on a lot of feedback. And so therefore, um, each end user can have a role at the application level. So let's say you have a dozen applications. You could have each application can have a specific role. And then end users that authenticate with an API key basically to that app get the role for that particular application that they've been assigned to. So this lets you have as many roles as you want for a given email address as an end user, much better. Um, API keys, Todd will cover this, but in short, um, you can easily make your APIs kind of public, or we call this a, a um, kind of a, a credential list or without authentication. So you can have a default role for the app and you can expose different APIs for that default role. If you want to have you know, guest registration or you want to make your APIs public for consumption, you can also use these API key keys to make, obviously, you know, typically private role-based access control. Um, Todd will show a little bit about those mechanics. Um, pretty straightforward. Lastly, JWT, stateless operation at scale. Um, this has a number of advantages. It's, it's, uh, it lets you make your session timeout a lot more configurable. So this is a good feature. If you, you know, with mobile applications, you don't want to log people out all the time. So you can kind of have the tokens can refresh themselves periodically. Um, and, and so you can decide just in a little config file, which um, we'll talk about in the demo, what exactly you want that behavior to be. Like how often do they refresh and how often do people basically have to re-authenticate into the application that you're building. Um, API customization. So this is the third area. I won't spend too much time before the demo. Just bear with me a little bit more because I want to talk about this. It's important. Um, you can now script with uh, JavaScript in a couple different ways. Um, V8 is a sandboxed engine, right, that runs a parallel process that scales really, really well. If you're using Node.js, um, you can do that as well. So Node is getting really popular and you can um, call Node scripts from Dream Factory and invoke those, which is a nice feature. And then PHP, tried and true, you can always use PHP to run um, server-side scripts as well. The, the server-side scripts, the way to think about it, there are scripts that you, that we call them event scripts, so those basically are tied to API calls, like say you have a SQL database and you have a bunch of create, read, update, delete calls that are auto-generated in Dream Factory, you can tie um, any script to any of those endpoints in either direction, so on the API request um, and or the API response for any of those endpoints, you can implement uh, V8 JavaScript, um, Node.js or PHP. Now the big area that we wanted to extend in 2.0 um, was really making custom APIs a, uh, a kind of a first class service. And custom APIs are a little bit different than event uh, driven APIs. A custom API, think of it as just any program that you write that is an API. And Todd will show an example. So we wanted to make this really easy and, and so you can create, if you need to, your own custom services. You might have remote web services that already exist, that's great, hook them up. But if you need to create a fresh API, you can do that too, and um, you can do it right in the product, and that's kind of key because what what we're really, um, you know, from a design goal is is applying all of the security measures and all of that back end um, functionality across every API that you build. So even if it's a custom API that you build, you should have the protection of the security, the role based access control on top of that API. So that is an area that we developed. You know, the important takeaway is first class service custom APIs. It's in the services tab now. You can easily write your custom API with, with JavaScript um, with the same languages above, just as the same with event scripts. And then the key thing is role-based access control. So if you, you uh, write a custom script, maybe you need to protect it with different roles. You might have different endpoints. And you can also use Swagger, um, really popular, probably the, the most popular by far, um, API documentation, which is, you know, we use it in the product as well to document the APIs. You can leverage Swagger to define all of your endpoints as well. So really good functionality there, and um, we're super excited about it. So uh, go give it a try. Now, a couple more additional enhancements. Um, just want to mention quickly, uh, we revamped our sample applications. So and Todd will show this in the, in the quick start. So when you go in the product, you're in the home tab. In the left sidebar, there's a quick start link. If you look at that, you'll see links to all of these sample apps. This is an address book uh, sample app. It works the same way for each of the different um, uh, toolkits here, iOS or Android and so forth, and it showcases a lot of the key use cases, so you can often learn by example, right? It, think of it as a tutorial, how to register, how to log in, how to create, read, update, delete, how to, um, you know, do child, uh, parent-child relationships and so forth. 
Um, and then the other thing to mention is we, Todd will show this SQLite support we added. So if you don't have a database that you want to use right away or you, you don't have access to it, you don't want to go through it, um, you can just, um, just add SQLite on the fly. It's really easy. So it's like trivial to get a working database with an API in version 2.0. So really, really good for prototyping. You probably don't want to use SQLite for a big enterprise production app, obviously, but to get up and running and to start building something, um, it's awesome. And then lastly, SAP, SQL Anywhere, we added these drivers. Uh, so this is um, you know, great for Sybase and some other of the SAP databases. And I will say directionally with our roadmap, this is the area that we'll continue to invest our time in, which is adding additional um, data sources. Um, uh, beyond just the ones here. So you think of all of the data stores out there, we, we cover the vast majority of bases now, but there will be other ones that we will definitely uh, build as well. So uh, with that, um, why don't we go ahead and uh, introduce Todd Appleton, our Director of Engineering, and uh, Todd, why don't you take it from here? All right, thank you, Ben. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Um, hey everyone, this is Todd Appleton. Um, as Ben said, I'm the Director of Engineering here at Dream Factory. And today I'll be giving you just a quick demo of some of the new features available in Dream Factory version 2.0. We'll start out with just a few words about the architecture and some of the changes there. Then we'll spend a little bit of time looking at specifics of changes to applications, users, and services. From an architecture perspective, um, the app has been completely rewritten as a Laravel application. So this is great because it makes Dream Factory very extensible. I just want to show you what I mean by that. This is uh, just a console window. I'm in my local Dream Factory install. Uh, it's actually a Bitnami installation on my Mac. Um, if I look at this vendor slash Dream Factory directory, you can see that we've got support here for a, n a number of different service types, and you get all of these you know, with each Dream Factory installation. But we support the concept of dynamic service types, which means you can also add your own after the fact. So if you had some you know, special, unusual kind of database that we didn't currently support, and you wanted to REST enable it using Dream Factory, with just a little bit of PHP programming, you could add it in much the way we've added these other ones and make it accessible using the Dream Factory REST API. So that's what I mean by extensible. Um, it, you can just plug in additional services um, that you've defined yourself if we haven't already supplied them for you. Um, ben mentioned, um, just want to reiterate that we do support Apache. Um, out of the box is the default web server. It is pretty simple to switch over to Nginx if you prefer that and we have instruction, instructions on how to do that on our wiki. And that can be found at wiki.dreamfactory.com. Uh, some of the stuff there is still a work in progress, but over the next couple of weeks you'll see that um, really coming together. There have been a number of API changes with version 2, um, and due to this and other reasons, version 2 is not backwards compatible with version 1. Um, the good news is that it's easy to update an existing app to version 2. And I just wanted to run through just sort of the highlights of how you would do that, just so you get a feel for the, the type of changes involved. This is actually a page from our wiki uh, that just contains the high-level steps that you might go through um, when converting an app over. Um, the, most, the first thing you'll notice using the API is that the slash rest prefix is now versioned. Uh, so in version 2, it's now slash API slash v2. Also, we've separated the uh, session management for admins and non-admin users. If I'm an admin, I would post my email and password to system admin session to get a session token. If I'm a non-admin, I would just post the email and password to user session and that would uh, log me in. Um, so that's a little bit different before they, they used the same endpoint. When dealing with uh, records, say I'm retrieving records from a particular database, it used to just be service name slash table name. Um, we've added one more level in there, which is 
what we're calling the resource. So now it's service name slash resource, which could be underscore table or underscore schema uh, for a database service, and then the tape followed by the table name. So this just makes things a little more consistent. You've got underscore table and underscore schema. Um, there's not like a missing level there when you're not doing schema. Um, another thing you would notice is that when you're creating or retrieving records, uh, we now require them to be wrapped as an array, and the name of that array has to be resource. It's no longer record like it was in version one. So this is a pretty trivial change, but it's definitely something you want to be aware of um, if you are familiar with version one. And then just real quick, a couple more things. Um, we'll touch this in a little more detail here shortly, but the app now sends an API key, uh, typically as a, a header, and this replaces the old app name header that we had in version one. Also, we've now renamed session ID to session token, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about tokens here shortly. So I just want to give you a quick overview, overview there of some of the you know, practical changes you might run across um, between version one and version two. Also, I'd like to mention that you can use any database you want for the system tables. In version one, you're kind of tied to use the local MySQL database that came with Dream Factory. Um, but now you could use some external database. It could be uh, you know, Postgres. You can even use SQLite if you want. Um, so there's a lot less restrictions there about where the actual system tables, users, services, things like that are stored. All that stuff can be configured in the ENB file. Um, so if I'm back in my home directory here for Dream Factory, just, I can edit that ENB file. A um, couple of things to note here, if you set debug to true, you'll get a lot more information if there is an error. So that's always good for troubleshooting. Um, if you scroll down to the database settings, this is where you could specify your own database for the Dream Factory system tables. And then down towards the bottom here, the last thing I wanted to cover is the session tokens. Uh, ben mentioned that we converted from PHP sessions over to use JSON web tokens. And just want to tell you a little bit about how you configure that. There's two settings here, and both of these numbers are in minutes. If you look down at the very bottom, it's got DF, JWT, TTL. So this first timeout, which is in my case set to 60 minutes, before that expires the session is valid and you know you can make as many calls as you want using that session token. Now once that first one expires but the second one has not yet expired, then the token is invalid but it can be refreshed um, during that second period. And then after the second uh, timeout expires it's no longer refreshable so it's invalid can't refresh it, the user's going to have to re-authenticate, you know, which typically is just a re-login um, to their system. Um, so this provides, you know, some degree of flexibility, but, you know, it's still really secure. Um, you can read up on JSON web tokens. There's a lot of information out there um, about those. So let's jump over to the actual admin console. I'd like to show you some of the changes um, that we've made there. On the home page, we've got an updated intro movie. Um, this is, provides a really good overview of Dream Factory and also kind of delves into the particulars of Dream Factory 2.0. We go to the Quick Start tab. We've got all of the sample applications here. So rather than do you know a traditional SDK where you've got function wrappers around all the API calls, we decided it would just be better to you know, do kind of real-world examples, and a non-trivial one is a lot more than a to-do list or something like that. So the idea of these apps, they're all kind of the same functionality, is that it's a, a contact address book app, and you can have groups that can contain any number of contacts, so it, it exercises relationships between different tables, um, and then also shows you how to do registration of new users, um, with open registration turned on, 
as well as how to log in and log out. So just kind of a, a quick start to really show you in whatever environment you like how to use Stream Factory. Um, resources and downloads are just exactly what they sound like pretty much. This has got links to various developer information and then downloads just provides links to all the various ways to install Dream Factory. Uh, jumping over to the Apps tab, uh, first thing you'll notice here is this big long API key and as I mentioned earlier this is what replaced the old app name parameter that we used to use. So this is a randomly generated Actually, it's not randomly generated, but it's generated based on um, which user and other things, but it, it needs to be included with every API call because it tells the Dream Factory instance who's making that call. If I go to the details for an application, <clears throat> in the upper right here I've got the default role and this is the role that's used when an unauthenticated request is made to the API. So basically this replaces what we used to call um, guest role or guest access. So in my case, I've just got it set to this role that I've already created that allows uh, basically full access to my database. Uh, but you can restrict that down to be as uh, you know, restrictive as you like. The storage types for apps are mostly the same. There's one new one um, that I'll talk about. No storage required would be something like an iOS or Android app where there's not actually files on the server. You know, the app lives on the client itself. The second option here, provision file storage, would be your typical you know, JavaScript or web app that has uh, files, HTML, CSS, JavaScript that need to be served up by your Dream Factory instance for that app to work. Um, so typically you're going to import that application to a file storage service, make that service public so people can get to the app, um, and then they can get to it by going to index.html or whatever your entry point is for that application. And the new one for 2.0 is on this web server. If you go to your Dream Factory installation, there's a public directory. So you can essentially put an entire application inside that public directory and it'll be accessible um, you know, as an app. The last one's really simple. On a remote URL just means when you launch the app, go to the specified URL. So that's just kind of a trivial application config there. Another thing we've done is separated admin and non-admin users. So now you can see there's two different tabs here, one for admins and one for non-admins, which we just refer to as users. If you click on a user and go to the roles tab, you'll see that now there's a separate role available for each application for each user. So this is a lot more flexible than it used to be where um, each app or sorry, each user had only a single role assignable. If there's no role assigned, then it'll just use the default role for that application. I've only got one assigned here, which is for my JavaScript example app, and um, therefore if this user accesses, accesses that app, they'll have this role assigned, which would give them full access to that database. For configuring things like open registration or user invites, we've moved that functionality. It used to be under the main config tab up here, um, but now since it really applies to users, we've moved it over under the user service. So if I click user and then go to config, it looks pretty much the same as it did, but um, you know it's, it's now just in a different location. And just to clarify what open registration is, it basically allows people to create themselves as a user. So if you had an app where you wanted people to be able to register and become a user without having to go through um, you know, all kinds of <laughs> sign-ups and stuff like that, you can turn on open registration and then you would give them 
you know, a form in your app where they would enter their desired email address, whatever user information, and a password, and then that's submitted via the API, and then they'll get a session token back. So it's created them as a user, and then logged them in all potentially all in one step if you configure it that way. So I'd like to spend the bulk of, t of this demo talking about uh, some of the new services that we've added and also give you an example of how you can you, um, access those services from the API docs. Each instance now comes with SQLite by default and there's one that's pre-configured already to use called DB. If I click on that, I can jump over to the config tab for that SQLite database. The only thing really to configure for this is the file name that houses that database. Everything's stored in a single file um, for these SQLite DBs. And in fact, if you want to see where those files are, you can just go over here to your Dream Factory install and look at storage slash databases. And there you'll see the files for the various uh, SQLite databases that I've created. This is a Bitnami install, and it also comes with a complete MySQL and MongoDB server as part of the Bitnami environment. So, um, you know, not only is the server there, but it's also, as you can see here, pre-configured, um, so you can directly connect to it using the API docs. Um, so let's look at an example of, of what the API docs are and, and how you can use them. So I'm going to start out by just creating a new SQLite service since that's really quick and easy. SQLite doesn't support all the features of SQL Server or some of the others, but as Ben said, it's really good for development and just getting something up and running quickly. And now I'll select SQLite. give it a unique name. Uh, the credentials aren't actually required for this. Now I can just click create. So now I've created the service and the first time that service is accessed it's going to create that database uh, file for me. So if I go to API docs, here's my new service. Let's do a get on schema and see what tables are available in there. Since it's new, there should be none. And that's what we see. So here's the request. It's the base URL for my instance. The prefix is API v2. The service name is light. And then the resource I'm accessing is underscore schema. And since there's no tables, it just returned an empty array. So let's go create a table on that. I just can jump over to schema, select my new service. A really quick way, this is a nice tip to create a new table is to click upload JSON and it's pre-populated with just a simple to-do table. It's got ID, name, and complete fields. You could change the names, you know, if you wanted multiple versions of this, you could add, delete fields, whatever you need to. Um, but I'm just going to upload it as is. Okay, so now that table's created. Um, let me go back to API docs and do that same thing. I'll do a get on schema. And so now we've got the table I just created as the single table in that new SQLite database. And in a similar manner, you can um, add records um, just by going over here to data. That's going to make me refresh here. So now there's no records created, but if I want to create one, I can just do this. All right, now we've got one record in that table. Let's jump back over to the API docs and see if that shows up. So now when I'm getting records, I'm not going to go to schema. I want to go to 
a get on a table name, and then I'll set the table name. Yeah, so I'm gonna Hold on, got a cash problem here. All right, there we go. Um, so it's the to-do table. I can fill in all types of options here. Um, I'll just get all records, so I can just leave it blank. And there's uh, that single record I just created um, in, here in JSON format. So there's nothing special about this URL here. I could use Postman or some other tool to do the exact same thing. Let's look at a couple of the other services. Oh, before I do that, I just want to mention all the same stuff applies to the MySQL and Mongo as well. So they're uh, you know, fully supported via the API docs, so you can exercise the REST API uh, from there for any of those other database types as well. It's not just the SQLite. Let's look at a few of the other services that are new or improved. Just click the create, and then it's got a menu here that has all the available services. So up here at the top, our support for LDAP and Active Directory is much improved. Um, this basically lets you authenticate against your existing AD user base. And we're now working on extending that um, so that you'll be able to associate AD groups to Dream Factory roles. So look for that here over the next few weeks. Also, a lot of improvements to our integration with OAuth. It's now really easy to add one of these as a provider. So I'll select Facebook. And just give it a name for your service. The config is pretty straightforward. You just tell it what role you want users who log in through Facebook to have. And I've only got one role, so I'll just use that. And then the rest of this is just basic OAuth config. Um, that you would get from Facebook and put in here. Once you create that as a service, then on your login screen for your admin, you would see Facebook show up as a login option in addition to the normal um, email password form. One of the most powerful new service types that we've added is the ability to create a custom scripting service. In our 1.0 product, you could have what we referred to as custom scripts, um, but they really weren't full-blown services. So now they are, which means you can assign roles to limit access to those custom scripts. The other great thing about them being a service is that you can define a service definition, which allows them to be access from Swagger, which is basically what the API docs is. So let's look at an example of that. I've got a, a trivial service here named add. Literally all it does is add two numbers together. So you would pass it two query parameters, n1 and n2, and then it'll return the result of adding those two numbers. If I go to the config tab, um, this is a v8.js script. As Ben mentioned, we've also added support for PHP and Node in version 2. Uh, V8 is nice because it's sandboxed. There's not a lot of bad that can happen as far as security. You need to be more careful with PHP. You know, it could potentially have access to the file system or other resources on your server. So just something to be aware of when you're uh, writing PHP scripts. Here's the actual script for that service. We include Lodash by default with uh, all Dream Factory installs, so you can just do a require if that's what you'd like to use. You could also use jQuery or other um, libraries. It's really up to you. It checks to make sure that the verb is get, 
So you could fork the functionality here or even call different other custom scripts from inside this one based on the specified HTTP verb. And from that point, it's pretty simple. It just loops through and makes sure that N1 and N2 are in the supplied parameters. If they're not, it throws an exception, which returns a 500 error back to the client. Um, otherwise, it proceeds and converts those two params to numbers and then returns a JSON object representing the result of, of that sum. So I can show you that in the service definition here. We've actually created one for this service. And we're going to be providing a, a, a bunch of examples of how to do this for custom services. This is kind of a very trivial example, um, but it does show you that just with a pretty simple service definition, you can make it fully available in the API docs. So let's jump over and look at that. Oops, wrong one. The only operation for this service is, is to get at the root level slash add. If I click that, I can expand it out. And keep in mind that all this stuff you see here was built out based on that service definition that I just showed you. So by building that service definition, either using the JSON editor or the graphical editor that we provide, um, you can have all your REST APIs supported here in the API docs. So this one's pretty simple. I'll just give it a couple of numbers here. So just like the database ones, I've got the um, instance URL, the prefix, and then the custom script name, and then the query parameters that I entered in up above here. And re just returns the result of uh, 10 back um, to display here. Now just to show you there's no funny business going on, I can do the same thing from uh, Postman. So here I've got that exact same URL. Got n1 equal 3, n2 equal 4, and can post that and I get a result back of 7. So it's the exact same thing, one's just using the API docs and the other is just using a generic REST client. The last thing I wanted to mention is that we're, we're adding a new type of service, which is pretty cool, called a SOAP service. And this will let you access remote SOAP services using JSON. So the client can communicate with Dream Factory just using simple JSON format. And then we'll use SOAP client on the back end to convert that over to a properly built SOAP request and then make the call to the service using, you know, so XML. And then going back the other way, we'll undo it and then provide the JSON back to the client. So it really simplifies things, um, you know, when you're dealing with these, these SOAP services and, you know, trying to do modern uh, client-side apps. So that about wraps up what I wanted to show for today. Um, I think we'll have some time here for questions, so I'll turn things back over to Ben for that. Great. Thanks, Todd. Uh, I want to just show a couple more things. Um, let me just navigate down here. Okay, great. So, Todd, thanks for the demo. Um, everyone, that was a lot to cover. I, I think we covered, um, you know, the, the bases in terms of the big changes in version 2.0. Um, I do want to point out uh, some additional resources to let you dig into the details a lot more. Um, we have a bunch of resources on our website, so if you hop on over to dreamfactor.com slash resources, we have a bunch of um, things that will help you, including links to our documentation, uh, which is listed uh, below, wiki.dreamfactor.com. A uh, bunch of other things up there, some um, you know technical white papers on things like security and scalability to give you uh, you know more information, kind of what's under the hood um, that goes well beyond what we showed in the demo today. Um, 
Todd mentioned the docs are in process. We're, we're you know, close to being done with those. Um, bear with us a few more weeks, but most of um, what you'll need is up there now. There's a tutorials link on wiki.dreamfactory.com. It shows you a bunch of uh, kind of mini tutorials to get you up and running. The other thing is we have a forum at community.dreamfactory.com. So you can go there. You can ask questions. There's tons of information in there. It's a, basically a knowledge base. Uh, you can browse it um, or sign up for an account, and it's very easy, and you can log any questions you have there as well. Um, check out our blog. We've got a lot of tutorials going on there and a lot of kind of news and updates. Uh, we publish there pretty frequently. And then the other thing, downloads. I um, actually just want to show these last uh, couple things. So downloads, there's a link there, very easy, dreamfactory.com slash downloads. And then, of course, you can pull directly from GitHub as well. We um, manage everything there. It's an open source product, um, Apache 2 license, so check it out on GitHub as well if you'd uh, want to give that a look. Um, do want to just show a couple things. Uh, the technical resources is here, so dreamfactory.com slash resources. And then the important thing, just want to mention this to, so people understand, you can sign up for a free developer account, which is where we're hosting Dream Factory for you. It's totally free. You can sign up without installing anything. So you go to dreamfactory.com and then click the orange button to sign up. That will get you an account and you can start using it and playing with it and actually connecting to your data. Um, even though it's hosted, it's very easy to connect to your own uh, data sources and try it out. Um, there's a bunch of install options, so a really popular choice is before you even install it on a server, you can just go and get a local installation, and you can click any of these links. These go to um, our partner, uh, Bitnami, and you'll see if you link on those, uh, you just go and basically download and install the um, operating system of your choice. So think of it as kind of like an install shield setup, very easy, follow the, the screens, you don't have to do any complex setup, and that will get it up and running on your local system uh, really easily. So that's really good for trying it out, and what Todd showed today was just running on his local um, Mac um, operating system. And then here you have a bunch of different cloud installers, so when you get to running this in a server environment, um, you know, kind of Dream Factory with our partner, Bitnami, we support all of the really popular cloud installation options. We're also up on Docker Hub, so that's a really good option. Click on that, you'll go to docker, uh, hub.docker.com, and you can follow the directions to get your Docker install working, and of course there's always the GitHub um, link there. So um, lots of options, um, definitely give it a try. Um, the only other thing, check out the forum if you have questions, again, community.dreamfactor.com. You can go there and there's uh, quite a bit of information there. So with that, uh, hopefully this has been useful to everyone. I do want to, um, you know, we still have a, about 10 minutes left. I'm not, I'm not sure if we need that much time, but we'll go ahead and um, open up the floor to uh, Q&A. And um, let's do that. And uh, here's our information. You can contact us as well uh, at any time uh, by these email addresses. And I'll just actually leave this slide up and running uh, right now. So thanks, everyone. Uh, any questions came over, Tom? Yeah, we do have a few questions, Ben. Uh, just a little housekeeping really quickly. Uh, you know, for those people on the webinar, if you do have a question while we're doing this, please go ahead and pop it into the questions area of the GoToMeeting interface. Right there on your toolbar, you'll see the questions area, and you can type a question in there. Um, so, Ben, I'm just going to uh, read off a few here for you guys. So, one question is, does your free hosted system have any limitations? Oh, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so it has one uh, limitation, which is important to point out. Um, it doesn't. We don't enable the server-side scripting capability, and that's um, because we're hosting it, and it's actually a, a multi-tenant um, system shared by uh, thousands and thousands of developers. So we don't want people running you know, kind of rogue scripts or introducing infinite loops and so forth. You know, lots of things go wrong there using compute resources. Um, so that's sandboxed out. Um, so if, if you really want to just try it out and get something up and running, the hosted system is great. If you're, if you're getting into it and want to do some server-side scripting and, and do some of the things that, um, that Todd demoed today, uh, then you should go ahead and install it locally and that works like a charm or just run it on, on uh, any cloud. It's really, really easy to set up with Bitnami. Um, so that's the, really the scripting is the only limitation there. Okay, great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, here's a question. What is the best way to synchronize the configuration of multiple instances in development? Would it be possible to version control with Git, for example? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we're working on some features related to that. And Todd, you, let me 
let me try to answer it, and then Todd, you might want to weigh in on some ideas here. So one thing, Todd showed the uh, the options for how you're you know running the application. One thing that we we've gotten feedback on actually through the forum and through other channels, developers have asked doing in our surveys and so forth for a way to integrate really well with Git. Um, we we are thinking about a feature where you could just pull um, kind of the, the the latest binaries. Um, programmatically, you know, you, you could just set it up so that your application is, you know, kind of running and managed on GitHub, um, and you could point to that. Um, I will, I will say one thing though. There, there's a, there's a reasonable way to do it now. It's not fully automated like that, but you can import applications. So you can put in a URL, um, and like you can import an app from from uh, GitHub, and there's a utility to do that. If you go to applications, you can, you can basically hit this import button and bring your binaries in, and that will at least imported into the system. Um, the other thing I'll mention is there's, you, you can like import and export the applications really easily um, in Dream Factory. So in the config tab, you can basically export out your services, your apps, your schema, and all that good stuff, and then import it um, into a different environment. Um, that's still, you know, you're doing that um, uh, from the user interface. Um, so there's some room for improvement there. The way that we're really thinking about this actually for production, like through the whole app life cycle, we didn't talk about this product today because that's not what the webinar was about, but we have an enterprise product that's um, in beta right now, and you can actually go to dreamfactor.com and, and do our website, and you can sign up and install it and try it out. And what that does is it's really for provisioning. So this lets you import and export your entire instance. So this is like think of the use, the classic use case of you know, pushing applications from, say, your dev environment to your test environment. So you have a you have your own developer instance, and you need to push it to a QA sandbox. That's really what the enterprise product is about, and you can do all of that stuff from the command line with the enterprise product. So the enterprise product is really for managing like lots of instances of Dream Factory, um, and that's really for deployment and and lot you know teams. Um, but there are ways to do it without that capability. So if you're just building it's the, your small shop or an individual developer. My suggestion would be, for now, to import the app from GitHub or to um, use the uh, export utility to move it between instances, and then stay tuned for additional features. Um, you, you can contact us, actually, by these email addresses or go in the forum if you have specific use cases that you want to talk about, and we'd love to discuss it because this is an area where um, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear feedback on real-world use cases. Thanks, Ben. Um, okay, so we have a, actually Kim left us a really great question here about email templates, but Kim, if you could just email support at dreamfactory.com. She's got some detailed examples in there, but if you would email that to support at dreamfactory.com, they'll help you run that to ground. Um, so the next question, uh, is there a sample app for iOS written in Swift available? Um, there isn't yet, um, but what I would do is uh, get, so on GitHub, um, if, you, if you go into uh, either our slash resources page, let me just bring this up so everyone can see it. <clears throat> so on the resources page or in the product, Todd showed there the quick start. Um, you, you can go look at the iOS app. So this is a, an Objective-C application, um, and you can see how it works. So, so in terms of the API calls, um, I'm not a Swift expert, but I believe that your API calls will work just fine. So you can implement your client-side code in Swift. Um, this is something that we'll do probably, you know, just to, as a code example. Um, but if you know Swift or, or learning Swift, you should be able to take uh, that iOS application, uh, the sample app, and retrofit it to your needs. Because really, the API calls are the API calls. There's nothing special about them, and you ought to be able to invoke them as is, um, just, just as you would any other REST API. So, um, if, and if you have questions, like definitely ask in the forum. And maybe you already have it. I saw a couple. Um, questions on that, and hopefully we'll, we'll try to get back to you, but um, th there, there should be a way to do it today pretty easily with the existing example app. Um, Todd, any thoughts there? No, I think you're right. It's something we'd like to do. I um, just haven't done it yet. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. So we got one last question here. Um, what is the performance like, max API calls per second, for example? Okay, that's a great question. Um, let me try to answer that and, and talk about it um, the way that, that we think about it and also um, point you to a resource that you can look at because we've, we've done some benchmarking um, that will be 
uh, probably useful for you to check out. So, so Dream Factory, you know, as a, as a LAMP stack, it's it scales, right? Like both horizontally and vertically. And, and what we mean by that is like you can add additional processors. And the goal of the whole system is that you you basically get highly efficient um, API calls per second. So you, the way we think about it is, okay, what's the goal of your performance? Are you trying to get, you know, 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds? Like what's the goal you're optimizing for in terms of speed? Um, in terms of latency, like the request response, how long does it take round trip? And then with that goal, um, what you do is you you add compute to it, right? Just like any other system, and that should scale really, really um, effectively. Like it's just a linear scale out. You add more processors, you get you can go you know 100 API calls per second, 200, 300. You just keep going up, and um, that's a pretty well understood relationship. And we can I'll point you to a white paper that talks about that. The other thing you can do is, you know, so that's like a vertical or an add processor scale out. The other thing you can do is load balance as well. So this is the idea of load balancing your API calls. So you set up multiple web servers and load balance. And the cool thing about 2.0 is that it, it's totally stateless, right, with this JSON web tokens. So you can distribute that API call load across multiple web servers. And then your server-side scripting with V8, it's unlike a single-threaded Node.js, it, you, know, you can parallel process. So lots of those API calls can be coming in, and that's how you can achieve um, load balance you know, with load balancers and then also divide up the labor um, with the server-side with the scripting. Um, we're definitely working on some reference implementation, like the configuration of all that, so your DevOps team can know how to do that. And we'll write up some reference uh, information for that. In the meantime, you can contact us, and we can you know, talk about it and help you with that, um, especially if, if uh, you end up buying a, one of our support plans as part of what we cover in that is, is kind of consulting on that. So, Will, in the resources, what you should check out is the Dream Factory Scalability Guide. You can click on this, and this is a kind of a deep dive on how to scale out Dream Factory. Um, and, and really, the under the hood, what's happening. Now, what I would say is you can kind of see the uh, the various, um, like basically the architecture, like the REST requests and the JSON responses and how everything's multi-threaded. And then the empirical information here to check out is, let me just scroll down real quick, take a look at this because really what we've done is we've set up some scenarios um, with uh, Apache testing uh, and some benchmarking and we've got you know different concurrent users and different API, basically API calls um, happening uh, concurrently. And then with different processors, so we go to four to eight, and then to 16, and you can see the relationship. So here we go up to uh, 240 API calls per second, and your mean time on milliseconds is, is 264 here. And there's actually very little variability. Uh, so the standard div of the API, of basically the latency is low. It's very predictable. So the way this works is you just scale it out. So you want more processors, fine. That can scale you up to many more than 240 API calls per second. You can get a lot more than that pretty easily, and it's very predictable. Um, so uh, that's it. Um, any other questions? No, Ben, I think that's it. And uh, I want to thank you and Todd both for your